I'm going to read a couple of things. I thought I'd start uh, with a little snippet from my new novel. Uh, this is Scrapple. Um, and it came out uh, in July, uh, which is not a good time to release a book, it turns out, if there's a pandemic going on. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, uh, it exists, and I'm happy it ex exists. Um, I'll give you a little backstory before the part um, that I'm going to read. Let me put my glasses on. Um, so the book is about a 15-year-old boy named Robert Flanagan, who's just moved from a small town in Oregon with his mother and his little sister, Bridget. Uh, and they've moved to Philadelphia so that they could be closer to his older brother, um, Sean. Uh, Sean had left Oregon to play football for a fictional college that, uh, that I named Hassler, uh, but he dropped out when he learned his girlfriend is pregnant. And so he's currently living in um, Philadelphia with his girlfriend, Angela, and their twin babies. And uh, the part I'm going to read is Robert's first visit to Sean's apartment with his mother and his little sister, uh, Bridget, and they're knocking on the door and not getting an answer. Their mother knocked a third time, but the crying only sharpened. The apartment wasn't supposed to be that big. A converted hotel suite, Sean had said. Just a living room, a bedroom, and galley kitchen. This was his third apartment in a year and the smallest yet, but, Sean said, it had a view of the Schuylkill through the gaps in the buildings. What's taking so long, Bridget asked. She was five and impatient, and they ignored her. Their mother handed Robert the housewarming fern, chosen because it reminded them of Oregon, all green and optimistic. Her face settled into a hard, stubborn worry. Tension built up in her. It pulsed from her skin in waves. She put the spare key in the lock, her mouth pressed in a line. She laid a hand on the knob. Later, Robert would know that his world folded flat in that instant, though the moment was over before he was aware of it. He hardly saw a thing as his mother slipped inside, but he did see something. What exactly? Already he was trying to reconstruct the fragment of color and motion he'd glimpsed before his mother's hand caught him in the chest and pushed him back, before she said, wait here with Bridget, before she closed the door. None of the things that should have been in the living room were there. No smell of popcorn hanging in the air, no ice cold Coke stripping on the table, no Sean smiling to welcome them. No couch, no coffee table, no big screen TV. The room was empty except for a large rectangular crib. The crib wasn't right. It had a flowered bed sheet pulled over it, the corners tied down so that it looked like an oversized bird cage. And a little hand. Had he seen that at the sheet's edge? a small fist squeezing between the rails. Loud crying echoed in his ears as if, the, as if opening the door had increased the volume in the hallway even after the door had closed. He could feel the palm of his mother's hand on his chest where she'd pushed him. It smells out here, Bridget said. She hadn't seen, he realized. She hadn't seen and he couldn't tell her. Robert stopped as, he, as she reached for the door. Mom said to wait. I don't want to wait. We're going to. Bridget crossed her arm and stomped her pink shoe, but Robert didn't care so long as she was quiet. He strained his ears listening. You want something to do? He said. You can hold the fern. I'm not holding that dumb thing. Through the crying, Robert heard movement. Just one person. Maybe Sean had gone to look for them, but the game should have started by now. Hassler had a strong coach and a talented running back. Anything might happen, even against Notre Dame. More minutes, more waiting, finally. Open up for me, Robert, their mother said, tapping the other side of the door with her foot. She had a baby in each arm and Sean's old duffel over her shoulder. Where's Sean, Bridget asked, and Angela, Robert didn't say. Press the down button, Bridget but press it. The novel uh, will follow Robert as he tries to figure out what has happened uh, to his brother and to try and locate him. Um, I love that we were both writing about families, Sadie. Like I was thinking about that as you were reading. Um, and uh, like, I, I think it's such an important 
part of just uh, daily life. And, and I love it when it gets attention. Uh, the other things that I thought I'd read uh, come from the chat book, uh, which is The Heart Keeps Faulty Time. Um, and this is just out from Bull City Press this March. Um, I thought it was going to be, you know, such great, wonderful timing to have two books out at once um, and to get to talk to them. It was purely just uh, like lucky timing or so I thought. Um, and then maybe, maybe not so much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, I'm going to start with a story in here called Imaginary Number. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about um, time uh, and the time it takes to write, specifically in part because I'm working on another novel now. Um, and I'd like to just be able to sit down and da -da -da -da, brain dump it all into the computer. And so often, like, it, it comes in spurts and then uh, there are days like today where I'm staring at the computer knowing kind of what has to happen in the scene and not being able to to make it go or work or find the exact right uh, words and the exact right actions um, in, in today's case. Um, but then at other times, life will give you some sort of gift, like a seed of a story, and you just have to sit with it for a while, but then one day you'll figure out what to do with it, and, and the story comes from there. And in this case, um, this this one uh, this one comes from my daughter. Uh, she had said something, when my kids were little, especially, even now when they're older, but especially when they were little, sometimes they would say something that just stuck with me that seemed like this incredible wisdom. Um, and, and you recognize it, I think, as a gift at the time. I don't think I'm alone in, in, as a parent in having these moments where you're like, my kid just said something that I have to hold on to. Um, the one that I'll always remember is when my son was about two or three, uh, he looked at me and he said, mom, kissing is fun, but hugs are important. And I was like, God damn, he's, that's right, um, noted. <laughs> <laughs> holding on to that one. Um, in this case, my daughter was a bit of a sleepwalker. And uh, one night I'd heard her kind of stomping around upstairs. And so the next morning I asked her, like, was something going on in your room last night? What was, what was happening that you were making so much noise? And she said, oh, last night the aliens came. I danced with the aliens and they spoke to me in math. Um, and I was like, uh, that is definitely a story, but I have no idea how to write that story yet. Uh, so it took a few years, but eventually, I, I hope I figured out the words for it. So this is imaginary number and it's for my daughter Gwendolyn. That night she danced with the aliens. They spoke to her in math. In school, she was learning multiplication tables and isolation. She understood whispers as sound waves measuring the distance between planets. School math was rote. Alien math worked on another logic requiring no memory. Their three-step time altered her heart's beat. Though the waltz was a one-time thing, it was an instant that stretched its roots through her past and budded tendrils into every moment of her future. Just as in English, cleave can mean parting or coming together, their language allowed one time simultaneously to be all time. Or perhaps it was simply the nature of moments to be both fleeting and forever. There was no telling. The dance tempo was determined by her body, which unlike theirs was bound to the earth and the moon and the rotations of the sun, a concept of time born in a body brought up by those celestial bodies. Each step marked a moment between birth and death, between here and there, between alien and familiar. She knew love from her parents, though work took them daily. These new beings took her hands in their appendages. They matched their rhythm to hers then allowed rhythm to evolve, solving an equation. Down the hall, her parents stirred, though the music in the room was soundless. What called the aliens to her from across the stars? She did not know. When they returned from whence they came, she was no longer one lonely girl, but rather a girl for whom loneliness had become an imaginary number, a girl whose understanding stretched to contain galaxies, a girl whose limbs, even now, contained that once waltz. Um, 
And side note, um, the, my daughter, the, who that story is for, uh, just graduated high school and started college this year. And so I want to like send a shout out to her and to all the kids from the class of 2020, who kind of um, maybe more than, than most of us uh, have had a bit of a rough shot of it, this pandemic. And final side note on that, she also drew the picture that is the cover of this book, um, so which I love. Um, and so that's, uh, I don't know if you can see it really well, but, uh, but yeah. Anyway, so that's a, sh a shout out to her. Um, we mentioned Quarterly West and they, Quarterly West is also one of my favorite journals and they published one of the pieces in this, in this book. And so I thought I'd read it. It's, a, it's probably the oldest of the stories in this book. They, um, they were, I think the first short story publication that I was like, really, really proud of. Like I knew like, oh, I did something all right. And it got recognized by a journal that I love and respect. And so uh, this one's called Paper Hats. And uh, I'll just read it. The first one is simple. While his mother finishes adjusting her lipstick, the stranger in the orange tie shows the boy the series of folds that transforms his mother's Wall Street journal into both a boat and a hat. That night, everything changes. Bobo Bear becomes Robin Hood, then all his animals, an army of newsprint topped Robins filling his shelf. He folds 16 more hat boats the next afternoon, and so on. He unwraps a double mint plenty pack to fill the tub with the gum wrapper fleet. He makes 57 newspaper hats to have on hand for his next birthday party, though he does not know 57 people to invite. His mother sweeps the hats away in her fierce wind. I hadn't even looked at that paper yet. For a while, he folds smaller hats, hiding them in unexpected places, behind the saran wrap, tucked inside the spare toilet roll, the almonds on the coffee table wear many hats. The hats become more intricate, a fedora, a boater, the cap of an English fox hunter, the Kaiser's helmet. He watches for the battered Dotson and slips out to retrieve the paper before his mother notices its arrival. Afternoons, he walks to the library to study armory encyclopedias and women's fashion magazines. His mother now orders two papers, but he folds the second as well. He makes rules for his hats. No scissors, no tape, no crayons, no paint. Nothing but the paper, itself and something more all at once. His mother shrieks to find her second journal folded and folded into the neck armor of an imperial Japanese battle helmet. He apologizes by folding her next paper into a gift, a dainty pillbox circled with twisting clusters of roses, each stem delicately thorned. Enough, she cries and carries armload after armload to the hearth. He can't speak. The match flares, then dulls under the paper enough to raise hope before it flares again. He feels his heart not beating in his chest, but folding, folding. In this light, all his hats look like boats. Um, the last one I'm gonna read, I'm gonna go ahead and just spoil the ending right off the bat, um, which is my favorite thing to do with this particular story. Um, because it was, it, was, uh, it was another one that I, I had heard this, this uh, uh, thought experiment, um, which the premise was basically, uh, if you were to plant the nuclear codes in um, a human being's chest and the president had to actually kill the person in order to retrieve the codes, would it make nuclear war less likely? Um, because it makes death real in, in a way. And I thought, that's a cool idea. And I wonder if you could make a story out of it. But then I thought, um, I have no idea how to do that. Um, and, and maybe that's not my story to write. Maybe that's somebody else's story to write. Um, but then I also later, <laughs> separate thing, um, was kind of looking around online and I noticed this journal Barrel House, who I would come to work for later, um, but at the time was not affiliated with, uh, had this um, prompt thing, challenge going on called the Stupid Idea Junk Drawer. Um, and one of the stupid ideas in the junk drawer that they had offered for people to write about was um, clown parents disappointed by non-clown child. Uh, and I thought, I can absolutely write that. That feels like my kind of story. Um, 
And so one thank you to Matt Perez uh, for offering that prompt. Um, and then as I was sort of figuring like, okay, well, what are they gonna be disappointed in? Um, I thought, well, maybe actually that other idea, the thought experiment idea and this prompt should go together. And so I decided to put those two ideas together. And as I was sort of coming up with, with the mechanics of the story in my head, uh, I'd been listening to a book fight, uh, a podcast that I love called Book Fight, um, and they were discussing dumb writing prompts that shouldn't work. And one of them w offered a final line. Uh, and the final line that you had to end your story with was, money is the root of all evil, but a man needs roots. And so I thought, challenge accepted. Uh, and so I took that line and a few other Book Fight uh, episode lines and decided to work them in as well uh, into this flash fiction called The Key Bearer's Parents. We were good parents. We know people assume otherwise when they see our wide ties and honking red noses, but we were. We took that job seriously. We told our son that he could be anything he wanted to be, just like you're supposed to. Yes, we could see his embarrassment we when we showed up for career day. We saw how he threw the basketball into the field as our tiny car pulled in so that his friends would look away. Uh, though we were happy clowns, smiles broader and wider than any lips, the disappointment underneath our makeup was easy to read. It's fine, we said, fitting on our oversized shoes and adjusting the flowers in our hats. We told ourselves that he would get over it. On the news, the talk was all nuclear war and how to avoid it. The broadcast filled with the whole key bearer plan. Ethicists argued that it, war would be less likely if some kind of key were implanted in a person's heart. What, per, what president wouldn't pause if he had to stab the bearer to drop that bomb? The president, they said, must be the first to bloody his hands. We sheltered our boy from all that talk. Children should have aspirations. They should believe in their own future, if nothing else. We gave him tennis lessons, enrolled him in Spanish and pottery classes. He would tell us what his friends had signed up for and we would run to the parks office to sign him up as well. Sure, we showed him our own trade secrets, how to walk in hoop belted trousers, how to paint a face that reduces you to a single emotion, but he wasn't really interested and we wouldn't hold him back. We only wished his aspirations weren't so heavily laced with judgment against our own. Fine, no fine. While Congress continued its endless debates, we sent him to prep school and on to private college, exhausting all that we'd saved and then taking a series of loans. We worried over his talk of graduate school, an MBA, and how we would afford it. He wanted to be a professional, he said. A professional what? We never asked. He'd decide that in time. We pictured him leaning over a mahogany desk, sleeves rolled and tie abandoned, late at night when everyone else in the office had left. We pictured his boss patting him on the back one morning and telling him he'd made partner or would be the new CFO. The summer before his junior year, our son came home, played tennis with his friends in the morning and drank bourbon in the afternoon. No one should be so angry while wearing white shorts. In Congress, the idea of burying the key to nuclear annihilation like a treasure in a human chest was gaining traction. What about a trip to the fair, we asked. We'll get elephant ears, ride rides. You always love the tilt whirl. Fuck the tilted world, he growled, impressed with his own clever wordplay as he once again grabbed his rocket and headed out. Makeupless and uncostumed, relegated to the parked car, we watched him play. He scowled through the chain link, each serve fueled by rage, his forehands brutal, his overheads unapologetically smashed into the stomachs of his opponents. Perhaps he'll be a tennis coach, we whispered. That at least would bring some kind of joy, right? A brand of entertainment? When he decided not to go back to school, there was the electrician apprenticeship and we thought, okay, no more college, no more being a professional, but blue collar is fine. Our last electrician complained that he could only charge $58 an hour here while he got 92 in California 10 years ago, all of which seemed hopeful enough. It was more than we'd ever seen clowning, but that's life in the arts for you. Our boy was practical. Maybe he'd had too much time with his snobby friends. We th thought maybe his anger had spent itself out. 
When the bill passed, even the electrician thing evaporated. Yes, they voted a bipartisan victory and called for a volunteer to fill the key bearer's post. Good benefits, they claimed, a life of luxury, so long as you are willing to be murdered at any moment. We snorted at the nightly news. Who, we said to one another, would ever volunteer for such a thing? The whims of politics? The fickle world? Be serious. Life was too precious. If we knew anything, we knew that. Alone in his room, his door locked as always, our son was already filling out the online application. And now that he's been selected, fished from their pool of thousands of applicants, we know we should be happy for him. He has what he always wanted, steady pay, gourmet food on demand, a home in the nation's mansion, all the time in the world for tennis. Still, we can't help wondering, is it easier to kill a man who never laughs? This boy of ours, we wish we could paint a smile on his face, teach him to spread cheer. We wonder how he ever grew so joyless we tried to show him better right to the end. Money, we said, is the root of all evil. He only looked at us, mustering the closest thing to a grin he's ever possessed. Yeah, he said, but a man needs roots. Thank you.